during election season. It goes even higher when we win, which hasn't happened in a while, but it goes even higher when we win. So as a matter of practicality, it's going to be difficult and it's going to distract resources, right? It's going, to, it's going to take union resources away from engaging in political work. Right to work was sure bosses, uh, the Chamber of Commerce wanted to um, cut out unions because they have a profit incentive. They don't want us to be, you know, calling for better wages, better working conditions, the things that we need. But it was also right to work, I'm going to be frank with you, was about cutting off funding to the Democratic Party. And it was about cutting off funding to progressive um, interests and progressive organizations that labor has championed and helped for a long time because our values are shared. So this is about dismantling unions in Michigan similar to what they did in Wisconsin, right, when they passed this legislation. Um, it's very concerning. So the things that, that I, I ask you to know and I ask you to talk to people about, for, for crying out loud, talk to everyone you can about them, this is an attempt to grab power. Everything they are doing in the past two weeks, they've done in the past two weeks and that they're going to do in the next two weeks is about grabbing power from working people, from people who are trying to get a shot, from students, from educators, from working families, from people making minimum wage, from people who need to take time off to, get, um, to take care of themselves or their kids when they're sick or their family members, their parents, what have you. That's what this is about. So that's research. Uh, the other one is the union release time bill. Um, they, they talk about this as we're on union release and uh, it's unions doing union, it's union members doing union work but the government, the public employer is paying for it. And it's, you know, they talk about it as if it's lobbying or political. But I don't know about you, where are my union stewards in the room? Who are the stewards? Y'all got time with the limited amount of union time that you have to talk about politics or, or to go lobby legislators in Lansing? Right. You are there, you're defending the contract, you're defending employers or employees, you are working on curriculum, you are working on school improvement, you're working on university committees and things like that. There's just, it's, that's not what it is, but what they're trying to do is gut it. And actually our administrator allies in many cases have been incredible champions for us and supporting us because they see that this time is efficiency for taxpayers. It actually helps improve things. You know. Uh, when I worked for a private employer and I got um, uh, written up for being tardy, which half the time I was definitely just lazy, and half the time it was my car being a problem, but whatever, I get written up for it. So they, I meet with my supervisor and they have an HR rep, and you know what they tell you? The HR rep is there for me! <laughs> right? Cool. Who's been told that? It's complete and utter I'm not Bullshit. on camera, but thank you, Charlie, for pinch hitting on that one. Um, you know, it, it's complete nonsense. So the difference is we've all been there where there's been an employee who has made a mistake or has done something wrong or perhaps something so egregious probably shouldn't be teaching um, in a K-12 school, in a, in a university setting at all. Um, it is much better for the administration to have someone who is elected to look at the bigger picture and to represent the interests of the worker and the workplace and the students to be involved in that decision making time and to be involved in that. Not only that, but they are putting themselves in legal jeopardy because as you all know, we have Weingarten rights that are federal law requiring a discipline is going to be perhaps on the table. You have the right to union representation there. The, uni the university or the school cannot have that meeting without union representation. Now, if a parent comes in and they're, and this is K-12 is particularly problematic. Parent comes in in the middle of the day and wants to speak to the principal, will not take no for an answer. You are, some of you have K-12 experience or have been K-12 parents or whatever, so you'll, you'll know there's, it's rather difficult to tell a parent, we can't talk to you right now. Then they have to pull someone out of the classroom to represent that teacher in that meeting, to be involved in that conversation, or teacher, or custodian, or school secretary, or what have you. So basically, this is a whole bunch of nonsense meant to limit the union's ability to represent employees. It is about silencing employees. It's about eliminating their voice. Most of this time is on curriculum committees. In our K-12 settings, we spend a lot of time doing professional development, which professional development in, the dist in district provided PD is terrible, and having teachers involved tends to improve it. So all of this to say, there's no actual purpose. They talk about saving money, but every administ school administrator will say, actually, having this time saves us money. We would have to hire that HR person who the, the union is not going to like, who the, the teacher is not going to trust, the school employee is not going to trust. So instead, 
let's allow like some actual democracy here and allow people to choose their representatives, which is, you know, beyond certain elected officials right now. Um, so that's the union leave time recertification. There's a bill that will prohibit bargaining a calendar and schedule. So right now there's a whole list of things that K-12 teachers are not allowed to bargain um, as prohibited subjects. Um, this would add school calendar and school schedule to that. Um, it's punitive. It's one state representative who introduced it. Her, her father was a school superintendent and the union was mean to him during bargaining, so she's decided to take this away from them. Um, the union probably was mean to him, but they deserved okay, it. Um, so that's, that's a huge, um, huge problem that we're facing. Um, what am I missing here? I apologize. I did not put slides together, and if I had, I would have... We just found out that this, this calendar bill was added to the schedule for this week, tomorrow. Um, those are the major union hits. Then the next major thing, obviously, are the circumventing of paid sick time and minimum wage. As you know, those passed both the House and the Senate. Um, I mean, that's just, it's just despicable and disgusting what they did with those. Um, folks familiar with that, or would anyone care for me to go through a little bit of it? Okay. Um, and then uh, the bills to circumvent the Attorney General and the Secretary of State. Um, those are currently pending in the legislature. So the bill to circumvent the Attorney General has left the House and it's being considered by the Senate. The bills to circumvent the Secretary of State and undermine all of the elections, almost all of the election reforms passed in Proposal 3, those bills have left the Senate and they are in the House. Um, I, I don't know what to say other than it's a blatant power grab. Um, and the only thing that I think could save us is if any of these folks have a sense of shame. Um, and I do think, though, he's about to be gone, so I can, I can say things about him that aren't. Governor Snyder, I mean, he signed right to work when it was not on his agenda. He is not someone with a ton of willingness to stand up and fight for, you know, principles and what he truly believes in. That, on, on, on our issues. He will hold the line on, on a number of other values. That said, I have to know that the governor that we've gotten to work with on, on, on different things. So Snyder has uh, worked with us on a couple of different pieces of legislation. He's worked on different interests. He is not a friend of labor, and he is not a friend of public education. But as far as, and you know, his reaction to, to um, the best I can say for him is his reaction to Flint water crisis was better than many other Republicans. That said, we still have an entire city poisoned and we have not. I mean, if, Governor, if, if Mark Schauer had won the governorship, I'm pretty sure he would be in Flint right now digging ditches until every service line was replaced. Um, but that said, Snyder is not evil or malicious or have hatred towards labor and public <coughs> education the way some of these other folks do. And he doesn't have... And he does actually have a respect for the process, and he has a respect for bipartisanship in some ways, and he has worked on those things. So I say this not to say, that, I say this to say that there is hope, that putting pressure on the governor to veto this, these bills, I mean, I can guarantee you if we don't do it, we will lose. But I, can, I can't guarantee you that if we do it, we'll win. Um, but I can guarantee that there is there is an opportunity here. He doesn't want controversy. He doesn't want to leave off office with a legacy of having signed legislation that sent democracy to die. He, he's not that person. Bill Schuette is, to work on getting him not elected. But, but Rick Snyder, he's a nerd who's into accounting and wants to balance budgets and, and doesn't always see the human side of those issues. But, but I do think the pressure on, on Governor Snyder here could help us veto that legislation. The bills passed the House on party lines with two Republican, one Republican opposing. I know for certain Martin Howard Black, Republican from Troy, voted against those bills. He's actually one of my favorites. He's a good man. Um, and he's, he's with us on so many of these issues. Um, and then um, the Senate passed entirely on party lines, not a single Republican opposed those, those bills. So um, they're going to leave the legislature. They're going to get to his desk. And then the horse trading and the behind the scenes and the backroom deals will take over, and that will cause us a lot of problems. Um, 
So those are, those are the big major issues um, facing us on, on labor and, and working families legislation right now. Am I missing anything? Are there folks questions? We can go to questions, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Um, I'm Haigo Shagan. I'm, I'm an associate professor in the comm department, and uh, I didn't know I was on the, on the program, so I rushed over there at meeting downtown. If my eyes are red, it's because I took a scooter all the way up here. <laughs> Not a good idea, just letting you know, all of you. Even with these gloves, froze myself. Um, but I'm, I'm um, happy to do the uh, Q&A. Uh, I also edited the, uh, the news briefs that you have in front of you. Um, we turned this around fast, uh, as quickly as we could, so that uh, you would have a chance to see it and read the bills in question, uh, those issues that we went over just now. Um, the back page of it has uh, important information on numbers to call. Um, you will be getting this. You already have received it in your emails. Uh, and you can click on those links to find your your, your reps uh, to contact, as well as the governor's number is there as well, to, to put pressure on Governor Snyder. You will also be getting this at your homes by Friday, um, just to have it to be able to read. Uh, but the links, of course, don't you know, will work on the online version of it. So please, please take advantage of that and, and use your voice um, uh, so, so that we can uh, you know, put pressure as much as possible on, on legislators. Um, let me also say that the same thing is happening in Wisconsin. Uh, they are in the same fight as we are, as the state swept uh, Democrat. Uh, the outgoing uh, uh, executive branch uh, is still is doing it all it can with the uh, with the uh, Republican-run uh, legislation legislator to to pass bills the same way as, as it's happening here. By the way, I was going to ask you, Julia, uh, the governor elect in Wisconsin has has vowed to take it to court. The sort of the diminishing of his powers by the by the bills being passed in in, in uh, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Is that an option here? Do you think? Um. So, yes. Um. The difference. Is, so the Wisconsin bills do drastically directly limit the powers of the governor. Um. They are worse um, than what we're facing here. Um. And even the so the bill that runs around the attorney general. I kind of I kind of love the uh, levels of circular logic that are going to happen here with um, the, the legal challenge to this bill about who has the right to make legal challenges and whether or not the legislature could defend itself against us suing them for taking, giving themselves the right to be involved. Anyway, sorry. Um, it is, um, yes, there are ways that we could challenge legally. Um, we are dealing with questions of the state constitution, so it would go, for, uh, go through the state court process and end up at the state Supreme Court, which is currently a majority Republican, will be a narrower Republican majority um, come January. In fact, two, but two of the Republicans that are on that are much more moderate. And Beth Clement, who got re-elected to the Supreme Court, well, she got elected for the first time, she was a Snyder appointee, she voted in support of us on our 3% case that got 3% returned to our public school employees who were uh, denied it. She also got... Um, uh, she voted to support putting the gerrymandering proposal two on the ballot, and that is why the Republicans did not support her and campaign for her the way they campaigned for um, what's his name, Steve. Uh, the other anyway, he lost. So, oh well. Um, he, so it could go to the court, but that is not necessarily a done deal. Um, and then the Secretary of State bill as well, we could see the court that it is a run around the Constitution. Um, but again, uh, courts are about interpreting the law. And no one is capable of, I think, interpreting the law without looking at it through some sort of lens, so it's anyone's guess. Um, but our attorneys are looking into that. Our attorneys are also looking into a number of the anti-labor provisions, which I think the way that they wrote them, uh, the way Alec told them to write them, I should say, um, does does cause problems for the Michigan Constitution. So, um, yeah, people will sue. Um, so, um, thank you, Ben, as well, for the for the comments. Uh, so we have we can open it up to questions now. Uh, this this is an un unprecedented sort of attack. Uh, this lame duck in here and in Wisconsin. National media have paid attention to it too. Washington Post runs an article every so often on what's going on in Wisconsin and Michigan, and as does the New York Times. 
Um, but we're in the middle of it. And uh, we're going to live through it, we're going to see it, especially as, 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 um, as professors and, and, and staff here at the, at the academic institution, we're going to see some of it more directly than others. If you have questions, uh, it's time to engage uh, Ben and Julie with, uh, yes, maybe, maybe Ben you want to come up too as well, maybe? Uh, so, questions? Yes? How will the sick leave, the, um, the paid sick leave affect University or university or university or as a whole. Um, so that that bill, um, for those who have a union contract that already gives them sick leave time, there'll be no change, right? Like you can still bargain. Um, this is a way, sort of like similarly to how there's a minimum wage, but for those who, well, I don't want to talk, our, our non-tenure track professors would argue that perhaps they're not making minimum wage. Um, and they'd be right. Um, so you, it won't affect you and your contract because what you have is already better than what the state law provided. Um, for many employees, though, at the university that have never gotten paid sick leave, um, it'll it'll make it basically that the law would have given them 72 hours if they worked full time per year that they could cash in when necessary. Or not, excuse me, I shouldn't say cash in, that they could take a sick day when necessary. Um, this new law, the, the new revision to the law, dropped it from 72 to 32, I believe. Um, and then not only that, there were reporting requirements and things in that citizen initiative in that version of the legislation that they've gutted, so it makes it harder to re re enforce paid sick leave. Questions? Yes. I've seen reports regarding the paid sick leave and mandatory, the minimum wage, that because it was going to be a citizen-driven initiative and they passed it, that they can't go, potentially can't go back and pass, make changes to it? So that is the fun gamesmanship and clever vindictiveness of the Republicans in, in Lansing. And what they did was, if it was a citizen-initiated petition, basically, uh, citizen-initiated legislation, if they had not passed it, it would have gone to the ballot. And if the voters approved the language to be included in, in state law, then it would have required three-fifths of the legislature to make any changes to what, the, what voters decided should be law. By passing it themselves, when the legislation was sent to them, they then only to meet the 50% plus one threshold of a, major, a simple majority in order to make those changes. So that's what they did. So they passed it with overwhelming support in both the Senate and the House, and in both parties, overwhelming support for this legislation before it would have gone to the ballot, right? Like, they, they got petitions, and this is also what they did with prevailing wage, right? Where the governor vowed to veto the prevailing wage um, um, legislation to gut prevailing wage if it had gone to his desk, he vowed to veto it. So what they did was citizen-initiated legislation where they could not, they didn't need the governor to veto it if the legislature passes what the citizens asked for for legislation. So it just then needed to pass both chambers with the majority, which is what they did at minimum wage. It is, they're damn good at it. Like going and using those rules to the best of their ability to screw over everyone else. Hey, can I ask yeah. a question? Yeah. <laughs> and do they allocate money? <laughs> so can you explain? So if they allocate okay. money, the citizens can't? Yep. So, yes, so that's when the, 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 the buzzword would be referendum proof. So, the, as a citizenry, we have a right to enact or to change any legislation that exists, including our state constitution, which is also a higher threshold. But if you collect enough petition signatures, and it's got up because of our higher turnout, but if you've collected enough petition signatures, you can make anything a law or you can change any law, with the exception of the state budget. So what they do is they attach an appropriation to a bill to make it what's called a budget bill, so you cannot change it. And quite frankly, the purpose of this makes sense, that you shouldn't have the ability for every state budget, which only lasts a year anyway, to be able to go through, a vote, uh, go through that kind of a process because we would get nothing done. The right would attack and go after every single allocation for the Department of Human Services. They would go after every... Funding, you know, the agriculture is where our food stamps money comes from. Like there would be nothing that is safe from 
the right wing trying to gut essential federal programs. They could go after school funding via referendum and those sorts of things. So it is a thing that our state constitution allows that in many ways has served a purpose to um, allow government to function more simply. But if they add in to any bill at least $100,000 in an appropriation, it becomes referendum proof. In the case of the union recertification bill, they added $500,000. And they're making the unions make it, would make us pay for the privilege of those elections. Um, so I don't know what they're going to use that five hundred thousand dollars for, um, especially since it's appropriated now. But the bill doesn't even take effect until twenty twenty two. So even if it was just to sit in an interest bearing account, that would be a better use of taxpayer dollars than to get allocated the way it is. Sorry, I can get off on tangents. I, I think off. it's an important. Point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, what questions? Yeah. Okay. Second, kind of, um, what, what did they do with all the proposals? I've also read they're doing stuff with the proposed pre-voter initiative with the Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. Campaign finance reform. Did you the question? Um, yes. Yeah, it's not a good question. No, no, no. It's a great question. I think it's just other folks maybe couldn't hear, and, and I've got my teacher voice on, I guess. Um, no. Uh, so proposal three was the uh, promote the vote. It was a bunch of things that would have that will, um, that are now um, improve our election process and make it more fair and more accessible to more people. So um, included in it are things like we've got straight party voting back. Um, we've gotten things like uh, same day registration. Um, no reason absentee voting, meaning you don't have to you know, assume that you're going to be outside of the community. You can just say, I don't, I don't know whether I'm going to be there or not. I just want to vote by mail. Um, a lot of great things in there to, to ensure the vote. Making sure that military um, folks serving on deployment or overseas are able to get their ballots in time and get them back in time to be counted. Um, what they want to do with Proposal 3 is a couple of things. They want to take, most of what they want to do is take the enforcement and the implementation of those things. Like no reason absentee voting is, is not as hard. Implementing same day registration while absolutely important, and it means you can go to the polling location and register and vote on election day, is essential. Actually does require quite a bit of work, right? It requires a lot of paperwork, it requires a lot of counting, making sure that, you know, people aren't voting in multiple places or they're not registered in multiple places and ensuring a lot more um, information is fair. The same with automatic voter registration, which is part of it, meaning when you go to the Secretary of State, you get your driver's license, you're automatically registered to vote. They also have to work in an opt-out procedure. The biggest reason, Michigan has really high voter registration, actually, like in the 90 to 97 percent range of, like, adults are registered to vote here, believe it or not. They might not be registered in the same place, but we have high voter reg. The problem is, when people move or when people um, die or whatever, that they're not taken off the rolls. So all of those things, that bureaucracy and managing things at the Secretary of State, we needed someone highly competent, highly capable, who doesn't put up with nonsense, like Jocelyn Benson, to implement those things. They've essentially, the legislation that they've got essentially creates a commission that is allegedly bipartisan, which is a thing I don't believe in. I, or nonpartisan. I believe in bipartisanship. I believe in partisanship. I don't believe nonpartisan is ever a thing. I think people lie to themselves, and that's why, I, like, you have three Republicans and you have three Democrats on a commission. Go for it. Go to town. Fight it out. Get something that you know you can get a majority of people to support for. But pretending that you don't have a partisan leaning, it, to me, just doesn't make sense. So they create this commission that would be responsible for implementing all of those reforms and this commission that would be responsible for dealing with campaign finance. That is the thing that is particularly worrisome about them taking away from the Secretary of State. Um, because, as you know, there's already too much dark money and nonsense in politics. Quite frankly, the way that we do reporting in the state of Michigan with the Secretary of State is ridiculous. And it's, there's not really any checks and balances on it right now. Um, there's not anyone looking at those reports in a real way inside the government. There's some external groups that, that check into that, those things, but there's just they're understaffed, they're under resourced, and they're that way by design. And then creating this commission just adds a level of bureaucracy and nonsense that is going to make it even harder to enforce any of that. Thank you, Julie. Ben, can I ask you a question? Of all the bills that you went through, are, is, is one more damaging to Wayne State in particular than the others? Do you see more danger in some 
or one? Uh, yes, uh, the, the warranty program one would be very damaging because it's, it's this unknown cost and uh, inappropriately puts all of the responsibility for whether or not a teacher is ultimately successful on the teacher preparation institution um, rather than the individual themselves or the, the district where they work to support that teacher uh, in improvement. Uh, so it, it's not clear what that would look like, where would they go, what's the price tag for all of this, and it doesn't make sense already you know, 95% of teachers are rated effective or highly effective, so it's a solution uh, looking for a problem. So, I mean, our teachers are already pretty darn good. Yes, there can always be improvements, uh, but it's, it's another way to kind of attack the integrity of teacher preparation. The other one is um, that stipend for uh, supervisory teachers, the $1,000. Uh, and the expectation that College of Education had that kind of money uh, is unrealistic. So from a financial point of view, those could be very damaging and likely put some uh, preparation institutions out of business. Uh, we'll say both of those bills, so when the teacher prep left the house uh, last week, neither of those bills were included. So even if the other bills go through the state senate, I think we were able to sort of convince them enough of those problems. Um, yeah. somewhat reasonable ideas that are not well implemented in this legislation. So do you both see the set of bills as, as, as various ways of undermining, weakening the public education sector so that the sort of charter and, and the alternatives become more viable or more profitable? or, or Particularly or the, the innovative districts uh, legislation uh, coupled with the A to F rating and really pushing more of a, a market model, uh, which is just destabilizing to uh, our, our, public, our traditional public school systems. Uh, it'll just increase the amount of student mobility in and out of these systems, which if the money follows the kid, the child, the student. Um, so when they're moving in and out of these systems, it's not clear, uh, well, it is clear, <laughs> it is financially ruinous to our traditional public institutions, um, just from an economies of scale point of view. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I also see these things as a dangerous precedent for public universities. I mean, if they can do this with the College of Ed and say that the faculty needs a certain number of hours of professional development, then it's just an hour before they say all faculty need that. And likewise, this idea of a warranted education, so what if my students go out after two years, they don't make a hundred grand, now we have to pay them back, or, you know, I mean, right. that, I can see that, once it's in place, being extended more broadly, mm -hmm. and that still fits their agenda of an attack on public education in general. It's not just K-12, but on, on higher ed as well. I think frightening. part of it is a, a broader, again, with this problem, they had so much power for eight years, where they got to tell everyone what to do. There wasn't any Democratic Party that pushed back on them with any real teeth because they had all the power. And so this, this is a situation where to benefit private interests, for other people to make money, uh, a way of saying, of, of taking that power and deciding that they have dominion over everything. Um, and it's a very business mindset. Like the fact that they call it a warranty. I mean, I was a little crude when I, when I was first discussing this with someone, I'm like, what are we going to do? Take every kid goes through graduation and they get a stamp on their ass? I mean, you know, like, that, that you're guaranteed, right? Like One they didn't pay for. One they didn't pay for. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, 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 it's ludicrous. The, the idea that education is preparing widgets that can be guaranteed to have what they need. Um, talk to me about critical thinking before you talk to me about, like, teaching syntax to, progr syntax to programmers. Like, can you solve a problem? That is, a, that is something that you cannot quantify. All right, with that, um, let's, let's thank the speakers once more. Thank you. And I'm going to uh, pass the floor to uh, Mark Dilley, who's going to give you three words from the union. Yep, and I know there's pizza here, and it's wafting in here, so I'm going to make this very quick. Um, as I've, I've talked with Julie before, and, and Dan, we, we knocked on a lot of doors um, as a local union. 
very few people are home. We are searching for needles in a haystack. So we have 500 people that are in these Republican uh, state Senate and state House districts, and I'm, I've uh, cut the list so that they're just five on a page. Um, please, there's 30 people in here. If you could take some, or if you've signed up to come to phone banking, we can start calling these people and asking them individually to call uh, the state senators and the state uh, House folks. Uh, to make ourselves known because this is a, a game of inches and so we need everybody here to pitch in as much as they can. So please fill out the, the phone bank sheet or come after me. I know um, Jackie came and took a district uh, to call um, outside of the phone bank system. So please, if that's something that you're able to do, come see me over here. Um, can I make a pitch point? Sure. Here's the thing. If, if they had the votes to do this, they would have done it already. They don't have the votes right now, and the only way we keep the votes is if those legislators that are on that list maintain their opposition to the bills. They're not going to do that if we go silently into the night. We cannot do it. So that's why Mark is asking you to make those calls, because right now they are no's. The only way they will flip is if the other side puts more pressure on them than the people do. And so we need you to make these calls to keep them there. That was what I was supposed to say when I got prattling on about legislation. So, um, Mark? Yes. A question regarding the phone bank at the AAUP. I saw uh, the 5 to 6 p.m. slots. Are the state offices open and people answering the phone between 5 and 6? Um, so basically what I understand is that they, they tally calls coming in, even if there's um, voicemails. But we are not calling, this is calling members to ask them to, to call legislatures. Yes, this is call call back. Back. So, so and this is calling legislatures. That's calling legislatures. So yeah, so so the, the green sheet is the is the phone bank sheet. The um, the tan sheet is uh, the state senators that we're um, focusing on and the other side is the um, House Representative folks that we're focusing on. And that's where our lists are based out of here. So um, yeah. Thank you for the clarifying question. Appreciate so we're it. We're calling members in those districts. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy pizza and. and, and there's also these